Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Tonight I want to talk to you about trusting in Christ. I heard somebody say one time, salvation is more than just trusting in Christ. That's wrong. <laughs> it is not more than that. It is simply trusting in Christ. It's understanding what that means. So, so we're going to look at that tonight. And uh, let's look at what Paul had to say in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In Him, which is in Jesus, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Let's bow. Father, help us to understand this simple word tonight. Help us to understand and to be able to examine our heart and our confession, what we believe and how that has affected us. Lord, help us tonight that not to assume that because we feel very strongly about something that it's truth. Lord, help us to see what truth is as we look at your word. And Lord, for all this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, we started our winter Bible study in, in Ephesians chapter 1. And we started with those big powerhouse uh, doctrinal words. I mean, just strong words. The blessedness, the adoption, predestination, uh, all the things that we find, redemption, redeemed, uh, uh, being justified. Uh, and so really in the very beginning part, we probably covered most of the doctrine that we'll find in all of Ephesians. Paul begins the letter and then he expands on it. So what we talk about, we'll actually re-see a few times. Now Wednesday, I'm going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about the doctrine of predestination. And uh, we're going to just look a little deeper into that and uh, maybe even a few of the arguments that we have, not for the sake of, of looking at arguments, but just to see the different views uh, that are out there because there are some pretty strong opinions about that doctrine. Tonight, though, we're going to come right on down to the end of what we read this morning to the next two verses. And that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to... Uh, uh, probably share a little bit more broad of a, of a topic on Sunday mornings. On, Wednesday, on Sunday nights, we'll probably bring that down a notch or two or a verse or two and look at it in some detail until we cover all of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians uh, speaks to the mystery of Jesus Christ, the gospel. It is doctrinal, especially the first three chapters. The last three are more practical, and we'll certainly uh, look forward to that as we look at putting these uh, truths into practice. And, uh, and again, that's going to be a repeat and a recall. So by the time we finish, uh, we'll have a good feel for what Paul is, is uh, speaking. Now the, the letter, when it was first written and presented, it was assumed. Obviously, uh, it was geared toward the church at Ephesus. But as that letter distri was distributed amongst other New Testament uh, groups, it was read too. It was shared. And so, you know, we have it today uh, in our New Testament, and it is the Word of God. It's God breathed. The doctrine in it is absolutely necessary, and especially tonight. If I ask you a simple question, how were, or if I said, let's answer this question, how did I become a Christian? How did I become a Christian? To articulate that needs to be biblical. It needs to be doctrinal. It needs to be accurate. And it needs to be what God's Word says. Now, some people today in an American church, uh, growing up with religion, visiting, coming and going, uh, 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 being instructed by parents and grandparents and, and the whatnot, we can get all kind of, of a mixture of, of religious conversion. And that, that, I mean, in and of itself uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. But there comes a place where we have today so many in the church that don't have assurance of salvation 
or they doubt the conversion experience that they feel that they've had, or in their heart they know that it never occurred, but they're worried about what people might think about them uh, if they were to uh, uh, make that obvious or make that known. Folks, listen. We're talking about eternity. We're not, we're not talking about uh, uh, loss of face in a service one night or what somebody may think about you tomorrow. And we're not talking about offending somebody or making somebody doubt you. We're talking about an eternity, either with Jesus or without Him, either in heaven or in hell. There's no middle ground here. And it is ultimately and, ult and, and absolutely important that we be able to, to state easily and precisely how I became a Christian. It just needs to be this way. So what I want to do is I want you to hold that question in your mind. We're going to walk through a few of these verses, and then we're going to come back and we're going to close with that question. Okay? Now, let me just tell you this. A service one night when several people became Christians and they were saved, uh, it was obviously a work of the Holy Spirit of God because the other person didn't know what God was doing in the first person, and before it was over with, several came to know Christ, some of which uh, had been members of the church and very active in the church for a long time. Uh, at the end of that night, it made me back up as a young preacher and really reevaluate the confession that we share so easily and the accuracy of it. I think it's important that we know. And I remember sitting down with the church secretary who grew up in church, and I asked him, when you became a Christian, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened when you became a Christian. And, and her daughter was one that was saved, by the way. And she said, Brother Bud, she said, the first time, the first time that I was presented to the church, my grandmother told me that I was old enough to be baptized. That's what, that's what I was told. You're old enough to be baptized and be a member of the church. So I came down the aisle, and I presented that to the church, and they baptized me. But I was never saved. I never repented of my sins. I never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I joined the church because I was told I was old enough and ready to be baptized. Well, when we baptize kids here, a lot of times I'll have kids come and say, Brother Bud, I want to be baptized. And I remember sitting down with one child one time, and I said, Tell me why you feel that you need to be saved. And he said, well, that's a good question. I said, well, that's a real good question. Can you tell me why you feel the need for salvation? Now, folks, I could have sat there and led them through something and got them to repeat after me and pat them on the back and brought them up here in the church, but I've done them no good whatsoever if I haven't allowed the Holy Spirit of God to use the gospel of Jesus Christ to make an impact in their heart and bring them to a place where they call upon Christ. Because that's what the Bible says. So let's do it God's way, okay? Let's do it God's way. So let's see what God's way is, all right? So let's look at the first verse. In Him, which is Jesus, you also trusted. Now what does it mean to trust in Christ? What does it mean if I say I have trusted Christ? Now let's think about John 3, 16 for a minute. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You remember that verse? I bet you do. The idea of trusting is very much related to the idea of believing. It is relying on... Well, let me just go through and tell you what it is. The first thing is, it is to believe on Jesus Christ. It is to believe what he has said, who he says he is, it is believing in the work that he has accomplished. It is believing that Jesus Christ died on a cross, that he lived a sinless life, uh, that he died on a cross, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected. It is believing and adhering and relying on those things. It's also to believe the words that Jesus Christ said. Jesus said that he was the only way. Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said there's no other way to the Father but by me. So to trust in Christ is to trust that his words are true. To believe in Christ is to look to the cross. 
to see the blood shed, to see the life that was sacrificed. We can hear the words from the cross. We can witness the testimony that led to the cross. But in all of this, we got to trust in Christ to believe that this man, the Son of God who came to this earth, died in my place and took my penalty and paid my sin's price on that tree. He died on the cross in my place. The substitutionary sacrifice and death of Jesus Christ. Trusting in Christ is trusting in that sacrificial death. It's also believing and trusting in the resurrection, which is His witness. When Jesus Christ, look folks, when Jesus Christ came from that tomb, nobody had ever seen anything like that. I mean, obviously Lazarus was reanimated. He's going to die again. Jesus was come from the grave never to die again. First fruits of the dead. And when he came back from the dead and showed himself with many infallible proofs, when he revealed himself to his disciples, when he gave them those final instructions, all of this was a witness for them and for us today to go and tell others, to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to be witnesses in our Judea and Samaria and, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, our Jerusalem and, and, and the outer all. That is what we're to do. It's based on the witness of Christ. To trust in Christ is to rely and adhere and believe in all of these things. Okay? To trust in Christ is to allow Him and yield our life to His Lordship. It is for Him to be our Lord and Master. It is for us to take any aspect of our life and to throw it by Him. Does this bring glory to God? Would this please Christ? Is this in accordance to His Word? Would this be within His will? Is this an act of love out of obedience to His commands? All of these become us trusting Him to be our our Lord as well as our Savior. And then to trust in Christ also. And it's a lot, folks. When, when, when you say, I trust in Christ, it's not that I trust what Brother Bud said about Christ or I trust what the church taught about Christ or I trust what I believe about Christ. It is trusting the person of Christ. Ultimately, it's trusting the promises and the hope that we have in Christ. Now, here's what I want to tell you. If you've trusted Christ to save you and you've trusted Christ based on what He has accomplished and, and His words and His work, the witness on the cross, you've surrendered to Him. He is your Lord and Master. Master, you can trust Him to perform what He has said He will do. You can believe, you ever heard somebody say, if you stood before the Lord today, if you died right now and stood before the Lord and He said, why, would, why, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? It's not going to happen that way. But what would you say? I've trusted in you. I have nothing else. That is to trust in Him. I have no other hope. It's nothing I've done. It's not the good I've done. It's not the deeds I've done. It's not the preaching I've done. It's not uh, the help I've done. It's not some act of righteousness I've done. It's because I've trusted in Jesus Christ. So that, my friend, is what it means to trust in Christ. Okay? So if I ask you tonight, how do you know that you're saved? The first evidence that you should be able to point to is that I know that I know that I know that I have believed upon and trusted the person of Jesus Christ. I believe He's the Son of God. I believe He's my Savior. I believe He was a sacrifice. I believe He was resurrected. He is my Lord. He has saved me. He's going to keep me. There's no doubt about it. I trust Him completely. That's what it means to trust in Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in our churches today that do not have that. They don't have that. They hope they're saved. They hope they've believed enough or done enough. That's nothing, that is nothing, that is, that is nothing in what any of this says. It's not you hoping, it's you trusting in the one who has accomplished all of these things. So there's your first part, okay? Now, the second part, and actually when I first outlined this, 
I had it a little bit different. I had to go back and change my outline because I said, well, let's keep this in order based on what Paul said because it's very important. How did I come to a place that I could trust in Jesus this deeply? Well, here it is right there on the screen. Is it on behind me? Yeah. Okay, let's look at it together. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you're trusting and believing and adhering and relying and surrendering came after you heard the word of truth, which is the gospel. The gospel. So y'all have heard me say before, you don't wake up one morning and say, you know what? I've been living like hell lately. I've been living like the devil and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of all the mess that's in my life. I'm going to give my heart to Christ today and I'm going to turn over a new leaf and everything's going to be good. I am going to go to church today and I'm going to get saved. Doesn't work that way. Does not work that way. That's a decision that you're making based on one thing and that's your selfishness because you're sick of living the way you're living. You don't turn over a new leaf in salvation. You become a new creation in salvation. And it is a work that is completely wrought by God. So the second thing we've got to look at now is, did I hear the word of truth? And have I responded to the gospel? Now let's look in Romans chapter 10. And I want you to listen real carefully here. By the way, there's a doctrine that comes from this verse I'm fixing to read you really has nothing to do with sermon tonight. But it's an interesting doctrine. And some of our, uh, 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 not Pentecostal, but some of our uh, 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 some of our Baptist work, I, I'm trying to think of the name. It, uh, it's missionary, but it's kind of like the hard shell. In some of that, uh, they'll take this doctrine and they'll expand it to a point that only people who have heard the gospel from a preacher can be saved. And I don't, I don't believe that. But Paul is very clear in Romans chapter 10. I want you to hear this. Chapter 10 of Romans, verse 14. How then shall they call on Jesus in whom they've not believed? So if you haven't heard about Jesus, how could you call on him? Okay, there's the first part. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? I, I want you to see this, folks. When God orchestrated plan A of taking the news of his son around this world, he ordained it this way. Faithful witnesses are going to be sent by me, equipped and empowered, to go and to expound and to teach the good news of my son. And Jews or Gentiles who hear the truth and respond by faith will be saved. That's plan A, and there is no other plan. That's plan A. The only time that that may be usurped is during a part of Revelation when God sends angels into the atmosphere of the world to cry out to the inhabitants of the earth to repent and believe. They're not going to do it. The hearts are too hard. And it just shows the depravity and the condition of lost man. But God's going to do everything necessary to give man a chance. They're not going to respond. Verse 15, how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now folks, listen to me. It may not be enough to invite somebody to church just to get them here, but I'm telling you it is a tremendous start to get them in a place where they will be exposed 
to the teaching and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is God's method for people to come to saving faith. They're not going to hear about Jesus on a, a fishing trip or a softball tournament or a cheer dance leader or whatever or, or a, a, a vacation or, or just playing hooky. They're not going to hear it. Folks, people who come to church come to church to hear the gospel and the Bible proclaimed. We should have a desire for that too, by the way. It concerns me grievously the condition of so many and their hardness toward the preaching and learning and teaching of the Bible in a New Testament church. And we are living in the last days. Please come to me, with me, and hear the preaching at my church, reading friends and family and neighbors. That's evangelical. And I'm going to tell you something. How many of you in here today have earnestly reached out to somebody you cared about, invited them to church, and by coming to church, they became believers. Anybody be willing to raise your hand? Is there some in here who were invited to church and you came and you heard the gospel and you were saved? Anybody? I bet you were. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. For me, it was my dad, whom God turned his heart to his boys, and, and he called us and he said, Linda, I'm going to pick the boys up for church, have them dressed. They're going to Sunday school too. That was the beginning for us. And guess what happened when I got to church? I heard the gospel. Somebody asked me if I'd ever been saved. Folks, that wasn't happening when I watched the big movie on Channel 8 or wrestling, Mid-South Wrestling with the Junkyard Dog. Y'all remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't hear the gospel in any of that. We didn't have but three channels, kids. We had to turn it ourselves. Y'all just don't even know. But I'm telling you, when I was taken to church, did not want to go, was not excited about it. But when I was taken to church for the first time in my life, I began to learn about the good news of Jesus Christ. When you when when you're brought to vacation Bible school. That is some of the first places that boys and girls are, are exposed to the good news of Jesus Christ and the love of God. Sports camp. When, when kids invite their friends, they're hearing the good news of Christ. That is the purpose. That's why we're here. It is to be able to tell others of Christ and certainly to make disciples. So inviting people to church, folks, that's a good start, okay? Now, when we preach, and I guess this is more for me, but this is what I do. I'm going to preach about Jesus. I'm going to preach about grace of God. I'm going to preach about God's requirement for righteousness. I'm going to preach about the cross. There is no salvation message apart from the cross and blood. I'm going to talk about what God desires, what satisfies Him. And folks, listen. People come to our churches today, and if you're not careful, and I'm, I'm going to be critical of preachers, I think I can do it. I wouldn't even recommend y'all doing it, but I'm one of them. They may come to church and hear about salvation and not Christ. They need to go find another church. If we ever preach a Christless salvation, it's not the salvation of the Bible. If it's being a member of the church, of being a baptized person, of, of being a part of a denomination, of, of having a conviction about something, uh, believing the teachings and adhering to the, the teachings of the church, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the gospel. And so we, we got to have that, okay? Now when we preach the word, when, when we stand behind the pulpits, and this is what God calls us, by the way, He sends preachers. I never, in, in, in my wildest days, ever dreamed that I'd be a preacher. I didn't really have a desire to be a preacher. But I felt God's call to do so, and I'm going to do it until I die. I mean, it's just what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter where. It really doesn't matter where it is. I want to preach until He kills me or He comes back. He's not going to kill me. How about He takes me home? <laughs> I've always kind of wanted to die while I was preaching. So 
if I kill over while I'm preaching, y'all just let me die. Don't, come, don't call 911. Just let me go. But listen, we're to preach the word. God takes that preaching and he conveys faith to the heart of the people who are hearing. We become ministers of the word and the graces and the gospel and the good news of God and instruments whereby others may hear to believe. Now, if I didn't believe that, I'd quit preaching. I'd quit preaching. I believe that. I believe at any given time, at any given moment, God can take what Paul called the foolishness of preaching and he can convert the hearts of men. It's not me. It's him. It's him that does it. But it's by the means of preaching and presenting the gospel. Okay, there's a third thing. How was I saved? There was a time in my life when I heard the good news of Jesus Christ and I was convicted of my need for a Savior. And I trusted by faith in the work that Jesus Christ did for me. And in that moment, I was saved. But something else happened in that moment. Let's look at the last part of the verse. The gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The third thing that happens when we're saved is that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now we don't use seals a lot today. We really don't. I know when my brother moved to Brazil, he had to have a document that basically stated he was not a felon leaving the United States to find uh, citizenship or, or a life in Brazil. It had to come from the State Department. When you ordered that document, which was basically just giving them money, it came with a seal. But you couldn't fax that. They wanted the original with the original seal. And you just don't know how much of a pain it was to get that to Brazil. You'd think it'd be so simple. It was not simple. And so I learned something about how important a seal was. It wasn't just the seal like on titles and stuff, like we, we run copies and we see that. It's the actual foil seal they had to have from the United States State Department, or they didn't buy it. They didn't believe it. In the time, in biblical days, they would place a seal on a letter. Do you remember when Jesus was buried and they were worried? Well, the, his disciples may come and steal him in the night. So what did they do? They seal the tomb. What did that mean? That means that uh, uh, it was sealed with a, a pilot said, this is my seal, it is not to be broken. And it's a visible reference of either an order or an edict or ownership. But that's what it is, okay? Now, when someone received a letter for us, we have the, the recipient when we write it out. In that day, you looked at the seal to see who sent the letter. That's where the indication of who it came from. It was a seal, and they were unique, okay? So understand that, okay? Now... In that world, they branded cattle and slaves and others with a seal. And it denoted ownership. When people would see either the brand or a seal, there was less chance of it being stolen because it denoted the ownership of the person. So a seal in the biblical sense, in the world in which they lived when Paul wrote this, it denoted three things. It denoted that this belongs to me, ownership. The second, this is preserved and protected by me. The third thing is, this validates my portion or my part 
in whatever activity this is. So when Pilate uh, had his seal, he wasn't there to do it, but his seal denoted that his person was there to say this is the edict. Now here Paul says the Holy Spirit is the Christian's seal. So what does that mean? That means when you and I believe the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence within us, the sealing that comes is very similar to the seal uh, in a secular sense. It denotes who we belong to. It denotes that we are protected and kept by Him. And it also uh, gives us uh, some understanding of our future in Him. But also the working of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is we're being molded and made after the image of Christ. He becomes our tutor. He empowers us to do the work of ministry. He feeds us and leads us and convicts us. The work of the indwelling Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for the dynamic life of the believer. And apart from that, apart from that, the only evidence that you can claim that you belong to God is a mental ascent and a word of confession without any outward anything if the Holy Spirit has not sealed you and taken up residence in your life. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're sealed, Paul says here, until uh, uh, our inheritance, which is when we're in heaven. The working of the Holy Spirit in our life is the evidence and the proof that you and I need that our salvation and our confession is genuine. Without that, listen, without that, I would doubt the genuineness of my faith. And there really is no proof to me, or for that matter, toward anyone else. So let me just tell you, and I'm going to be candid here. You may like this and you may not. It's okay. If you profess to know Christ and there's no visible change in your conduct and in your love and, your, and, and what you do as far as living each day, if nothing has changed, I cannot comprehend how the Holy Spirit has come to take up residence in your life. I can't see it. Well, Brother Bud, it ain't up to you to see. Well, let me tell you something. If others don't see it and you can't recognize it, you need to be careful. Because these are the things Paul says. These are the things that Paul says are what happens when a person comes to know Christ. Romans chapter 8, 15 and 16 say, You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you see that? The Spirit of God bears witness to our spirit that you and I belong to the Lord. If that's not there, then something's missing. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is the Holy Spirit living the life and the heart of born-again Christians that enable us to cry out to God in a very personal and a very meaningful life and relationship. <clears throat> How do I know that I've been saved? We can answer that now. How do I know that I've been saved? There was a time in my life, and I'm taking this morning's sermon too, there's a time in my life where I had an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And I recognized then that I needed to be saved. Now what that means is God came looking for you. He brought you to a place where you would hear the gospel. 
He revealed himself to you. He will regenerate your heart in a, in a way that you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you hear the gospel, you need to respond to the gospel and you need to trust Christ. So I heard the gospel. I recognized the person and the work of Jesus Christ and I realized that I had not trusted and believed on him. I had religion and I came to church and I love my church but I never knew Jesus Christ and he never knew me. I trusted in Christ after I heard and the Holy Spirit has come into my heart and my life and has sealed me and is working in me and I am being changed and I sense it and I see it and others do too. Now folks, that is the biblical, the biblical way that we're saved. My prayer is, and my prayer was earlier today, Lord, if there's anyone here that has come to an acknowledged confession of faith any other way than what this word says, please do a work in their heart. And I trust the Lord to do that. I trust the Lord to do that. So let's bow for a word of prayer and let's let the Lord speak to our hearts tonight. Father, tonight I pray that through the same work of that Holy Spirit that seals us, that we might be convicted, that you would help us to examine our confession of faith in you according to your word and not according to what we feel about it. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's not come, as a result of responding to the good news of Christ, which they have heard tonight, that tonight, Lord, they might come as they are, yield their life to you, trust in you to be the Savior and Lord that, that you have said you are, trust in you as the Son of God, trust in you as the Lord of their life, trust in you in your word and your commands, trust in you in the hope and promise. Lord, if there's anyone here that has not been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, my prayer very simply is this, that that same Holy Spirit would help them to see the truth of where they belong and whose they are and whose they're not. And Lord, that even tonight, that they might look to you in salvation. Lord, my prayer is on a Sunday night at West Union that we just might see a move of your Holy Spirit in this place such that we may have never seen before. To your glory, I pray this, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.